Welcome to our first online talk organized by the David Rumsey Map Center in this COVID-19 impacted world that we currently live in. Uh, my name is Salim Mohammed. I am the head and curator of the center. Uh, the hour is going to go like this. Uh, after I introduce our speaker today, Dr. Lugli will present his talk for about 40 minutes. Uh, please hold on to your questions uh, during the talk. You can certainly type them in the question box in the meantime. Uh, once Dr. Lugli finishes his talk, I will repeat the questions uh, to Dr. Lugli uh, so he can respond. Uh, we expect we'll have about 15 minutes for uh, Q&A. So on to today's speaker. Dr. Emmanuel Lugli is an assistant professor in the Department of Art and Art History at Stanford University. Uh, Emmanuel is uh, no stranger to the center. Uh, he's had, he's taught classes at the Army Map Center using our resources in the past, uh, and he'll do so again uh, this quarter. He was a speaker at the symposium that, uh, that opened the Coordinates, Maps and Art, Exploring Shared Terrain exhibition uh, in April of last year. He is an expert in the history of measurements, urbanism, and cartography. Uh, he has written two books, a History of the Metric System in Italy and The Making of Measure in the Promise of Sameness, uh, the focus of uh, today's talk. Uh, with, with also with Dr. Joan Key at the University of Michigan, he has also edited a volume on scale in art, the first of its kind. Uh, besides the scholarly research uh, on questions of labor, precision, and the reach of intellectual networks, uh, he writes for magazines such as Vogue and Slate. So um, a little bit on uh, specifics about today's talk. Um, what measurements did architects, geographers, and politicians use to construct the cities, the roads, and the maps of pre-modern Italy? How were they made? Who has access to them and who didn't? Today, Emmanuel Lugli will explore an overlooked period in the history and meteorological knowledge during which standards were not kept in the safes of scientific academies, but installed in the open. As he argues in his new groundbreaking study, The Making of Measure and the Promise of Sameness, published by the University of Chicago Press last year, such displays reveal the curious and much overlooked duplicity of measurements, which rather than being taken as mere descriptors of the real, ought to be seen as powerful molds of ideas affecting our notions of what we consider similar, accurate, and truthful. We will learn from him today about how we can view measurement standards in a whole new way and learn about how they shape space and its representations. So without further ado, Dr. Emmanuel Lugli, welcome. Thank you, Salim, for such a generous introduction. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm just about to share my screen, so we can all start. Uh, can you all see it? Great. Yes. Um, so this is the cover of the book uh, that I'm presenting today. And thanks again to the David Ramsey Center for inviting me to talk about uh, perhaps what is the least well-known period of the history of measurements. Because uh, while I wrote a book about the metric system, I, you know, that book made me realize how little we know about the pre-modern history of measurements. And uh, because I was looking for answers of how people um, were measuring, of what material measurement standards were made, um, you know, I, I started like a new type of research that eventually led to this book. Uh, so my focus today is mostly on pre-modern measurements, in particular, to, um, I'll be talking about late medieval measurements displays. But I also hope to, um, you know, open the discussions to larger questions that will help us to relativize our notions of measurements. So I'm just going to start practically speaking about some of the case studies I'm talking about of the books. And the books contains way more than what we'll be able to cover in the next uh, half an hour or so. So let's talk from a city in Italy, um, the city of Verona, which is like one of my 
um, most interesting case studies. And this is just Google Maps, so you see the city from, from the top. And I want to focus on a particular space there, which is the main market square. It is the little like uh, segment in white there. This is called the Piazza delle Erbe today. And as you can see from the urbanism, it's just like a swelling of a regular street. This was uh, like a commercial artery that created in Roman times, Verona is a Roman city, that over the centuries has grown so to accommodate um, a daily market. And when you go there, uh, Verona is a beautiful city. This is one of the main uh, um, sites in the city center. You encounter some of the traditional markers uh, of a place of importance for the Middle Ages. So for instance, you see this colonnette with the little relief of the patron saint of the city. You cross the whole um, square and at the end you find a fountain which is important uh, as uh, this is a renaissance fountain for the um, for um, to convince people that the city has got the leverage and the capacity to bring water inside a city built of marble on the background you can see the column with the lion the venetian lion on the top which shows uh, that in uh, renaissance times verona was conquered by venice and became part of the venetian mainland and these are the monuments that everyone talks about when they talk about Verona. These are the monuments that have also been represented in many cartographic representations of the city. This has been created by Paolo Ligotti in 1620. It's here at Stanford. It's a very rare map. And if you focus on the map, you see um, that the piazza that is today known as Delle Erbe, it's called Piazza Grande, in, in Italian means just the main square. And in the background, you can see the Palazzo della Ragione, which is uh, literally the palace of the reason, but it's really the communal palace or the, or the governmental palace. But it's interesting for me, and we'll return to this, that government here and reasons are equal. They're put on the same level. You know, the palace where the governmental decisions are made is also the palace where reason dwells. And then we find some of the little monuments we discussed before the patron saint, the fountain and the column with the lion. But then in the center of the main square, there is a little monument that no one writes about. And yet it's in the center of the square, which is in the center of the city. And this is the first monument I would like to talk about because this monument is a canopy that preserves the measurement standards of the city. There are carved as uh, sort of grooves of a column. And uh, there, you can see there two little uh, bits of metal that are kind of sticking out to mark the ends of these measurement standards. So for instance, here there's some inscriptions on the top. I don't have a photograph of, but just take my words for it. It says that this is the braccio, that is the length standard used in Verona at the time. And this is the measurements that uh, tailors and cloth sellers were using it, right? You would, uh, you know, if you were an artisan, you would have like a wooden rod, uh, but the original measurement standard is an incision in marble. And this is the particular type of display uh, that I want to talk about. Why these things came about in Italy at the time? How did they work? Who was protecting them? And more importantly, why they're displayed in the open? Since uh, Today, we know that uh, measurement standards are actually uh, locked uh, in safes, uh, usually in scientific cabinets, uh, laboratories, uh, you know, outside of cities. Uh, um, so what happened there? Why the switch? So this is Verona is the first case that is, but we find if we go to, to move to other Italian cities, very similar displays. If you go to the city of Ancona on the Adriatic Sea, you go again to the governmental palace in the courtyard in the center, um, we find again two metallic bits that are sticking out. One which is the braccio, which is the land standard for cloth and for wood. And then immediately after that, there is the pie, or the foot, uh, which is the length standard, which is usually used for like uh, fields and space or architecture. And again, this is, shows us a very important distinctions that in pre-modern Europe, uh, um, 
standards of measurements are connected to the material they measure. Now, today we use basically measure, measurement standards just for particular type of dimensions, like length, capacity, volume, weight. At the time, it wasn't like that. There was a specific measurement for a specific type of material. And, uh, and uh, here I put the pictures of Cinderella by Walt Disney because what this image is showing here is that uh, that's how um, measurements were considered. So if you're an artisan, you have this kind of like bar, like a wooden bar. Every six months, you have to return to this uh, display in front of the governmental palace. You have to insert it in this kind of slot. And if it matches, that means that your standards can be authenticated, can be sealed by a, um, an official, and therefore you can keep using it. And this is the same strategy that happens in Cinderella. Now, it may seem far-fetched, but it actually, um, it's, it's the Precisely the same legal construct, pero from which uh, you know uh, who, whose fairy tales was the base for the Walt Disney movie, actually took the idea of chucking Cinderella's foot by um, Basile, an Italian Neapolitan, more specifically writer, who is the one who came up with this idea. At the time, they were always writing that is like Naples in the. Uh, 17th century, that's how measurements were checked. So you would put them inside a mold to make sure that the, the measurements was correct. And in, at the, the end of the Cinderella story is actually a, a legal case. She has to prove her identity in front of people they cannot recognize, right? And so how do you do? They adopt exactly this kind of system that comes from measurement standards. Like they take the mold, which is the slipper that is supposed to verify the identity of the mysterious girl, and they insert her foot into it to make sure that they match. If they match, Cinderella gets the seal of approval, and therefore uh, she's, you know, her identity is revealed. Okay, so there is the direct connections between the two, and. Uh, and uh, which is interesting for us because sometimes we forget uh, of how some of these legal practices actually shaped some of the stories that uh, still circulate among us. Uh, I'm showing you a couple of other examples because I want you to get a sense of the variety and, uh, of these displays. This is Reggio Emilia, still in the north. This is the baptistry dedicated to St. John. And there, if you look at the semicolon on the left, you find the two incisions, again, the two different lines standards. The long one is the so-called pertica, which is used for fields, and the short one is the braccio for cloths. If you look at it more closely, and here I've got a close-up, you can still see these kind of metal bits that are sticking out. The irons have been added exactly to demarcate precisely uh, the measurements, because if they were simply incised in a, um, carved in the stone, these would get abraded over time, weathered. And, and therefore, the metal somehow marked difference. We get lots of documents that shows how these metal bits were regularly substituted over time. And then we move to the close um, city, uh, the nearby city of Modena. We found the measurement standards on the apse of the cathedral. You find again the length for fields, the length for cloth, but also you find on the bottom left a brick and uh, on the bottom right uh, a roof tile, which uh, gives us an idea that everything was standardized in pre-modern Europe. It wasn't that kind of measurements. If you go to Padova, you even find a standard for bread. So the old loaves of bread should look like the same, okay? Sometimes I tend, um, I tend to say that um, pre-modern Italy was basically um, kind of socialism. You know, everything was con 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 controlled in a very, very um, precise way. And uh, there was very little uh, maneuver for errors at the time. So my research started this way. I started paying attention to all these uh, um, uh, displays. And uh, I started looking, uh, I started gathering information about them uh, to find out how they were made, you know, when they were made, and especially why they were made. So I started asking the traditional historical questions about this display, um, about which I should say, um, there's nothing written about. Even if all these monuments are in the city centers, there's basically no book 
about these displays. And, and this comes from like a variety of reasons. Uh, they're not very pretty to look at. They're very, simply, uh, they're very simple to like overlook. Um, they're basically just incisions in a wall. But also, I think this says a lot about what we care, what we don't care as historians. We think to a large extent that the questions of measuring is uh, uh, a problem of the past, a problem that the dark, uh, you know, uneducated Middle Ages may have had, but uh, we proudly believe that we have superated the issues and today instead our measure, measuring is accurate, it's very precise, something even kids learn in primary school, and therefore there's like no need to um, dwell on such issues. But what I find most interesting about my historical research on medieval measurements is how those display actually help us to rethink our faith in measurements today. That means also our faith in objectivity today. So I often take the past as uh, um, as a way to exert some sort of uh, critical attitudes towards uh, some of the beliefs uh, uh, of the present. So, in, in the book I go into great extents about all these aspects, but basically after I started gathering a lot of information about the display, and I collected more than 70 across the whole of the Italian peninsula, which by the way, they also display outside of Italy. I'm not claiming that Italy is the only country that has such a display. You find them in Switzerland, you find them in Germany, you find them in southern France, you find them in uh, Israel, you find them in uh, um, Northern Africa, like in Tunisia, you find them in Spain. Uh, it's just that my focus is in Italy and uh, I needed sort of like geographical, the constrained geographical scope in order to understand what was going on historically. So uh, I came up with a, um, a, a solution which is pretty, pretty simple. These measurement displays appeared at the end of the 12th century. And there's one specific event that marks the possibility for the creations of this display, which is the piece of Constance in the 1180 thing. Now, I'm going for like just a second into like a, a detailed medieval history. What happened in the 12th century, there's a massive fight between the King of Italy, that is also happens to be the emperor, and uh, Italian cities. Italian cities uh, such as Modena, Verona, uh, Reggio, some of the cities we've seen, they join a military league to fight the emperor. The emperor is hardly ever present in Italy, and therefore he doesn't exert justice as he should. So they create a league and they fight it, and they successfully uh, defeat him in numerous battles, at the end of which there is the Peace of Constance. And during the Peace of Constance, they negotiate some of the rights that they, by default, they are um, the property of the emperor, but that they want to claim as their own. These are called the regalia, which means basically uh, royal privileges. And the cities demand for some of these regalia. And among them, there is the right to control measurements and weight. This is a very important legal, moral, especially commercial right. You know, having the right of measuring basically gives you the right to exert justice over a uh, territory. So by getting this right, I mean, I mean other things, for instance, uh, the capacity to kind of pass laws, these Italian cities become independent. And that's why we call them um, city-states, you know, or they're kind of Republican cities. And that starts an economic boom that is, first of all, um, it's first of all started as a, as a, a legal independence. So after the Peace of Constance, we start seeing numerous documents from, you know, from, uh, that appears in different archives, from church archives, state archives, and so on, that start talking about local measurements. The first ones are the, at the end of the 12th century in Bergamo, then we find them in Bologna, then we find them in Modena. They start cropping up everywhere. And eventually the display will appear. I just mentioned Bologna, for instance. In Bologna, again, the measurement standards appear 
currently on the communal palace, which by the way, the communal palace could have only be built after the Peace of Constance, because that's only the time where the, um, these Italian cities can become politically independent, right? So they built the communal palace and they immediately stamp on their facades, these molds that basically gives freedom to every life activity, right? From the making of bread to like the measuring of the fields, right? And today this being pretty inconspicuous, this is kind of like a wide angle view of the palace. As you can see, the measurement standards are there on the bottom, right? And, uh, but still never does, they were on the eye level, they were for everyone to see. And they were in the middle of the square, and what we're seeing right now is the main market square in Bologna. Right, because the, these measurements are supposed to facilitate economic operations that take place on a daily basis in these places. And, but for me, it's, it, it was very interesting to try to understand a little bit more about this. So for instance, we know that in Bologna, these measurement displays start appearing in 1250, right? So only 70 years after you know, the Peace of Constance that we also have to accommodate for like some loss of documents we may have. And they originally built them in a canopy like the one we've seen in Verona, right? And everyone has got access to them. And for me, this is very inter an interesting question, why everyone is supposed to have access to them? We even have like uh, written evidence for this. Uh, for instance, if we look at the statues of Bologna, which are among the earliest in Europe, and this is like a page from the sort of um, the section uh, about uh, um, judicial rights, right? You can see in this kind of illuminations on the left, uh, this kind of like doctor that is telling off a person who's basically uncuffed on the back, right? And it's telling you, you know, this is the sections about wrongdoing. And that's where measurements is being discussed. And there's a very interesting expressions that's being used in the statutes, which is, uh, and by the way, before I say that to that, also look at this kind of canopy here in Bologna. Can you see this kind of chains on the side? This is next to the measurements because the, the people that were found um, falsifying standards, counterfeiting them, and so on, they were literally uncuffed to this canopy. Okay, so there is an intrinsic connection between fairness, the idea of measurements, it's the Bible is also talking about that, and wrongdoing. And wrongdoing is redefined precisely in these times as, you know, ignoring measures, ignoring the standards. Okay, so anyway, I was saying there's a specific expression that is um, used at the time, which is that any citizens you know, can accuse another citizens of counterfeiting or tampering, you know, with this measurement display. And again, please pay attention to any citizen. We're not living in democratic cities in the Middle Ages. Any citizen means any good citizen, which means basically any bourgeois, any middle class, any person that has some sort of property, that has some sort of representation. So we're talking about like 20% of the population, right? Um, so, but any of these kind of good citizens could attack an order good citizens and accuse them of having tampering with this kind of measurement standards or of not measuring correctly. And this is for me is absolutely fascinating. So these displays were created in the open to, uh, well, let me say to here for a second, to, um, because they thought that they had to rely on the, a larger body of populations in order to guarantee that these measurement standards will never be altered. Um, they didn't have a police system at the time. I mean, they had guards, they had bodyguards, but not quite a police system as we have nowadays. But even having a police system would mean that someone would have to stay on the market all the time. Whereas in Italy, you know, especially at the time, you know, the urban population is a such, you always have people, you know, crossing the main square. That's basically where all the economic activities is taking place. Also the legal activities, right? Court is held in the open. So there's this kind of like buzzy, energetic, const, you know, constant flow of people there. And what the, you know, the notaries in Bologna are thinking at the time is like, why are we not taking advantage of this constant flow of people? Let's make these people, let's turn it into a sort of police. Let's take advantage of their eyes and let's use them as a way to control this display because eventually the measurements are what are binding people together. It's what is defining the cities as a whole. 
And uh, so all these discussions, which as you can see, they're kind of uh, moving away from questions of legality, questions of commerce, to become about the culture of the place, started to be discussed in the treatises of the time. There is a um, religious figure, a uh, university lecturer, whose name is uh, Jean-Pierre de Olivier, is a friend of Dante. Uh, he lectures at the university in Florence and then to Montpellier, and he writes in one is, of his economic treatises that if every single citizen would start using a different measurement standard, that is, a measurement standard doesn't match with the city one, but they would be identical with the one used by every other citizen, the one used by the citizen would be the right measurement standards and not the one displayed by the city. This is completely revolutionary at the times. It means that, you know, the, the notaries are putting emphasis on the populations to control measurement standards rather than on an external, you know, authority to do so. But, and this is the interesting questions that I'm trying to discuss in the book, you know, the questions are not so clean cut in the Middle Ages. It's uh, this idea of relying on the populations as a monitoring body uh, to guarantee um, the preservations of the measurement standards uh, is in a sort of way too ideal, too utopian. And cities soon realize it's not enough to count on that. And this is what you're seeing in other documents. So for instance, if we move to Siena, again, we're looking at the public palace, the governmental palace. And if we go to one of the upper stories, there is the kind of governmental room where lots of the decisions are taking place. And this is frescoed with these kind of famous images of which I've got a better close up. And they are supposed to influence the rulers in Siena at the time. And one of the best preserved frescoes is painted by Ambrogio Lorenzetti in 1338, and it's centered on questions of measurements. Now, this is a complex diagram. It is like it's playing with a lot of ideas and the values and the principles that should really inspire the rulers in the end of the time. And the best way to look at it is to start from the top left corner. I'm just showing you the very beginning. Here, on a close up, we can see at the very top, there is a veiled angel who's holding a scale. That's an allegory of sapienza, that means wisdom in Latin, right? So she's holding this kind of bassy scale, you know, a symbol of justice, whose plates actually leveled, you know, by the allegory of justice, who's looking up, showing that she's always paying attention to wisdom, she's always thinking about wisdom in order to exert what justice really is. And on the sides of justice, we have to like, uh, you know, on the plates, uh, we find two other angels, one in red and one in white, that represents two subcategories of justice. One is the distributive justice, which is according to Aristotle, the justice that kind of makes you pay back for what you've done. So if you have faulted, if you have betrayed the state, you're going to get uh, you know, beheaded, you can see the angels like beheading a culprit, but also if you behave uh, rightly, you are crowned with, uh, you know, with a crown. So, you know, as a symbol of um, um, well doing, right? So this is a form, but there's another form of justice, which is the commutative justice, which means the capacity to distribute the tools of justice across the populations. And here you find the angels, this is a better, um, crisper kind of close up given to two well dressed men who are actually dressed in mercantile robes, tools that we've seen before. I remind you the examples from Reggio Emilia. We've got the long canna, which is the rod for uh, fields, and the shorter rod, which is for cloth, right? So the angel justice is giving the tools to the merchants so that they can spread them through use uh, and somehow educate the population about the utility and the justice that is intrinsic to these tools. Notice here that there are merchants somehow work as mediators between these angelic forces and the rest of the populations. And this is because in Siena, you know, Siena moved away from this kind of Bolognese democratic uh, approach to actually give uh, iron bars to the merchants so they would keep them inside the guild, inside the kind of like headquarters as a way to somehow, you know, guarantees that the measurement standards wouldn't change, 
besides this kind of two um, standards of length, we also find standards of volume of capacity. And we're lucky enough that the archive in Venice have preserved a nearly identical volume for grains, which at the time was called the Staio, that is also the oldest measurement standards that we have in Italy. It dates to the um, 13th century. And, uh, and I would like to pay attention a little bit to how this object is used. If you're unfamiliar to how this may have been used in the market, I'm showing you like a, a pictures where you realize there's an official there that is measuring and leveling, patting with a hand on the top, right? Because it's not enough to have like the standard itself. If you like cook, if you bake, for instance, you realize that when you're dealing with cups or teaspoons, that you can have heat volumes or they can be leveled, right? So then you need to have some extra instructions. And by the statutes, we realize that every Italian city has come up with their own instructions of how you should deal with particulars, uh, with these particular standards. But what is interesting here is also what is saying uh, it, it's telling us that when this standard was made, right, in February uh, of 1263, and there's the name of the Doge, it is the, the main political authority in Venice. This is an important inscription because it speaks the Latin of notaries, but also uses the formulaic statements that you find in this kind of notary deeds, the usually certified measurements in commercial transactions. And it's true that if you read these and next to the statutes, we realize it's somehow redundant. But most people did not have access to the, to the statutes. They only had access to the objects. So they were looking on the objects for attempts to you know, identify these tools, but also to, for proofs of authentication. So that's what we're finding in the material fabric of these objects. Attempts to show that there's some sort of authorities that is guaranteeing for these tools. And all these are attempts to move away again from the democratic Bolognese approach and to actually say that here there is an authority, it is the Doge, that is actually guaranteeing this object. And in fact, if you read what's going on in Venice at the time, you find that the Doge appointed some officials that were making sure to create create copies through which they verify these original standards. And in case of debates, they will be the one that will take a decisions about which kind of officials, um, or which kind of standards we, should be employed. And we find in many others. If you go to Rome, to the Capitoline Museums, we find a standard for grains that was carved out of an ancient uh, Roman urn. And there, Rome adopts a similar system in Venice. They don't rely on the whole population, but actually they appoint one family, which is called the family of the Banderesi, and to supervise the making of measurement standards and to make sure that, uh, um, that uh, um, you know, they're not altered over time. So, and here you find in this kind of close up, the symbols of this kind of family, it's an office, but it's also family at the same time, but also some of the symbols of the authorities of Rome. Which means, and we find this, it becomes more and more frequent over time, which means that this kind of like democratic approach of making measurements displayed in the open, accessible to everyone, starts crumbling. So towards the late Middle Ages, we find that actually families of officials somehow keep the standards in their own houses or in their own headquarters. So they slowly start disappearing from view. And this becomes very, very common in their early modern period. So for instance, in Mantua, at the beginning of the 16th century, there's an enormous debate at the market. People literally have no idea what kind of measurement standards are accurate anymore. Apparently, the public displays have disappeared. There are even some jokes that such a display never, ever existed, right? So uh, lawyers are contacted to try to find the solutions about that. And eventually, the rulers decide that they should create new standards and they, they would keep them in their own palace. And these are the only standards we have today for the city of Mantua. This is, for instance, the weight of 50, of 50 libre, right? And we can tell it comes from the um, 
family of the Gonzaga that is ruling the city at the time because they put the coat of arms right in the center, right? And this is the same coat of arms you find on the coins at the same time, which I think is interesting comparisons because it shows how measurement standards are somehow a part of the uh, visual language of currency at the time. And these were kept in the palace if anyone had, and then replicas were constructed. And if anyone had issues with them, they would shoot should speak to an official appointed by the ruling family that would grant them access and somehow they'll deal with the, with the problem, right? At that point, somehow, the main authority, the rulers that take over the, you know, sort of democratic communal government of the Italian cities, sees the um, measurement standards as uh, um, their own possessions, but also, they derive their own power from these measurement standards. So there is a strong connection between power and uh, measurement standards. This is maintained even with the kind of like collapsing of this kind of medieval system. And this continues throughout the early modern period. If, for instance, if you look at the reform of measurement standards introduced by Maria Teresa in uh, 1756, they do exactly the same things. They um, Put, they kind of like emboss their own authority, the authority of the rulers on the main standards to show the kind of like connections between power and these tools. You can see here on the very top, this written Francesca and Maria Theresia Augustorum Providencia et Autoritatem, which means that these objects have been produced thanks to the providence and the authority of the majestic Francis and Maria Theresa of Austria. But also notice uh, the kind of flourishes, this kind of like beautiful uh, uh, craftsmanship that is used to nobilitate and to authenticate these um, tools. If these standards are beautiful, they are more likely to be perceived as authoritative, as rare, and as important. This is a completely different uh, visual vocabulary of what we've seen in the medieval period, which was extremely spartan, just two metal bits sticking out of a wall. It's that somehow, even visually and materially, was kind of conveying this idea of democracy, let's say. These type of aesthetics return then when the metric system is uh, constructed at the end of the 18th century. As you, as many of you probably know, the metric, um, the bar of the meter as nothing at all is just uh, one meter long, a few millimeters tall. There's no inscription on it, no flourishes. It does not derive authority from any other power because the big point of the metric system was exactly to move away from the royal authority of the French king and to create a standard of measurements which was considered to be universal. That idea, though, it took, it took a while to somehow reveal itself materially. And in the book, for instance, I show how even the prototype of the metric system, this is, for instance, the one created by Lenoir just three, four years before the platinum bar was created, had already some of the stamps of authority. So it's got the name of the maker, Lenoir, but it's also got this kind of little symbol there. You see that it shows that the metric bar has been created by uh, surveying the um, uh, the Earth, as you know, the metric system has been created through, um, by, you know, the metric system is one ten thousandth of a fourth of the Earth meridian. So it's connected to the Earth and there's like a massive debate about uh, um, how the meter should have been connected to the Earth, but it was general agreement, at least among the French scientists, that uh, um, the Earth um, should provide some sort of the departure point for the creations of the meter because the earth was perceived as universal, right? In the metric law of April 7th, 1794, that law explains the meter justifies kind of that everyone should look at it and see that um, this measurement is mine. So there should be uh, some, you know, everyone should see himself reflected in, in this particular type of measurements, right? Uh, and these ideas, they go back to the 17th century. This is the very first idea of a universal measurement system that was created by Gabriel Mouton, an abbot working at the end of the 17th century, that already started putting forward the idea 
uh, that the metric bar should be connected to the Earth. As you can see here, we return into the very simplistic uh, visual vocabulary uh, of medieval measurements, right? Where there's no this, any kind of like artificiality. This is again, it was one of the documents that shows the triangulations of the French um, meridian from which the metric system event eventually was derived. But one of the things, for instance, I talk also about the book is that the materiality of the object is also very important. While there was a debate of how the metric bar should be constructed, whether it should be like a portion of the earth or whether it should be derived from the pendulum, at the same time, the French are also involved in a lot of uh, um, explorations of Southern America and uh, among the various findings that there are these kind of amazing uh, platinum mines in uh, um, what they call Peru, that is actually Chile. And, uh, and it was platinum was considered the densest and therefore the purest and therefore the most powerful material and was also the material that would never um, bend, you know, the, the, the most rigid, the um, and uh, therefore was thought to be the perfect material to represent uh, this kind of new modern measurements, which was the metric system. And that's how they decided to create the metric bar. What you see here on the screen is the portrait of Antonio de Lua, who was uh, one of the people who discovered these mines and eventually published them. And also is the one that escorted the French scientists to go to Southern America. But, and, but the interesting thing is about the platinum was not, you usually said the platinum was considered to be the densest and the most modern, the most prestigious material, and that's why it was used. But also the platinum has got this kind of mirroring quality to it. When you take the, um, the metric bar in your hands, you can actually see yourself uh, like a mirror. And that's in a certain way, also a way by which you you could literally see that this bar belong to you as a citizen. So we try to, there's a new kind of form of visual and material language here that tries to go back to this material idea that a measurement is something that is actually enjoyed by the whole population. And, and this returns again, you can see some of the connections between the metric uh, bars and this kind of medieval standards. And I want to return to Verona and then conclude, just give you like another uh, interesting case study that has been forgotten. This is a legal case that started between two churches in Verona. One which is the Franciscan uh, Monastery of San Fermo, and then the a church of another religious or order, the Servites of Santa Maria della Scala. These are two closed churches. And the Franciscans of San Fermo go to a notary and they say, we know there is this uh, law passed by the Pope that says the new religious order cannot construct their buildings uh, within 140 braccia from another religious order. And uh, this new Santa Maria della Scala, uh, that has just been created. It was created in 1324. Uh, this legal case started in 1327. Uh, it says these people started, uh, they kind of erected their churches like a little bit too closely to us. And therefore we would like to bulldoze this church. And we would like to measure the distance between them as a way to construct. I'm bringing up this case that is to show you not only that medieval people were actually measuring, and I'll see you also have in a second, but to give you a sense of a connections between space and uh, uh, measurements, because this idea is always thought to start with the metric system, because the metric bar is derived from the earth, as I quickly, hastily kind of expressed just moments ago. But this case actually shows a different type of story. So, uh, uh, there was indeed, uh, a law in 1303, Pope Benedict 19 forbade this any new religious community to settle within 100, um, 140 um, canne. And for these people says, you know, 140 canne has been decided because every new, every church needs uh, basically a basin of alms, you know, these religious orders uh, rely on charity. And therefore it says, if we have the two churches that somehow have overlapping spheres of influence, we uh, substantially cut the revenue of some of these religious orders. So that's why the law was created in the first place. So the local lawyers that 
defer the situations to a larger patriarch. So the friars of Verona, they have to go to Aquileia, that is very close to Slovenia, uh, a distance that gives a sense of the importance of the matter, right? And when they go there, they re review the law of the Pope, and it says that actually the Pope, what it says, that the distance should be taken by straight line, which lanes it says per iron. And also they says that the case was originally started by a religious order in the city of Assisi. And because the law was created for Assisi, you know, the friars of Verona should ask for the standard measurements of Assisi to be, um, imported in Verona and to use that, which they do, the right to the Bishop of Assisi. And we have these amazing documentations that I found in Verona. And I just want to show you to like the, the sheer craziness of the documents that staple one next to each other. And there, one of the posits says, this document, this letter is arriving from Assisi and is arriving with a string that tells you the precise measurement has been used there, right? And, and that's why we can reconstruct, by the way, this whole case, because we got this kind of document. And so that's what I've done, right? I went to Verona. This document tells you exactly how they measured. So they, put, they pulled together a committee of people, an astronomer, an expert in grammar, a mathematician, a friar, and they started measuring from the, you know, from what they could do. So they started measuring, you can see um, on the streets. So their measurements, they find 80 canne, right? And then there is a little corner you can see in the middle. So they move right along the left and they document everything in writing. There's a notary with them tracking everything. And then they measure again. Then they get to the um, outer edge of the church. And then they realize that, they have, uh, that the Pope says that they have to measure by straight line. So they take the kind of closest distance between the two churches, then they realize that it's uh, 155 canne, and somehow they approximate and they think that one canna from Assisi uh, you know, represents three Veronese brachos, so there is a problem of conversions, and the notary says that one of the surveys, that is the people are being accused, is actually is against this conversion because it's not, um, is, uh, you know, it's not precise, which give, tells us a sense that uh, every form of measuring is always needs to be negotiated because it was always open to uh, various questions. And then anyway, they eventually create an abstract geometrical model that allows them to realize the distance between the two churches, actually 155 kind of, and therefore the new religious order is safe. So these case studies, just to give you a sense of how these people were measuring the enormous extent which they went to discuss these issues, but also to give a sense that uh, this is a moment that I would say even more than the 18th century, measurements are being hotly debated and it's open to all sorts of innovations, including the one that you can shape your territory according to a measurement standard is produced in a different city. And by, by a means of papal authority, that measurement standards applied to your sovereign place. Which means that in Italian cities, for instance, at the time, we have multiple measurement standards that dictate where things are taking place, where things can be erected, where buildings can be erected, and where they can be kind of like um, leveled down, right? And this is one of the points that I find most interesting is open to discussions. I would like to talk to all of you, uh, because this is one of the characteristics that measure does. It translates powers to the ground, turning measure into kind of a physical component of the city. And we have seen that with the metric system, how the metric system itself is an embodiment of power, but somehow derives its power from the earth, both in sense of space, the dimensions, the size of the globe, but also from the earth in sense of what can be extracted from it, such as this case of the platinum. But in the Middle Ages, we could already see these things happening and how actually if anything the middle ages shows that the opposite movement and how authority actually is using measuring standards as a way to become ground to somehow transform the urban fabric uh, according to the authority and once this these uh, authority is accepted and which means this kind of measurement standards as being accepted the urban fabric is transformed and it remains unchanged for many centuries. In fact, the urban fabric of Verona today, you know, is still there. 
perfectly uh, viable. And if we retrieve the authority that sustain particular measurement standards, we understand some of the power relationships that were at play at the time and that still somehow determine the cities in which we inhabit. So thank you. So these are some of the points I'd like to say. And, uh, and just to say, you know, uh, this is like some of the kind of scales we find on all the measurements. And again, these are also a way to kind of visualize uh, how measurements and the earth and the grounds are connected, right? There, this is a kind of visual strategy so to somehow represent whatever I'm discussing so far. Okay, but I don't want to take too much time. I would like to hear questions actually. So thank you. And I stop sharing the screen. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. That was a fascinating talk. Uh, and uh, I think um, we're, we're really uh, just imagine for a moment here that there are 120 people clapping and, and giving you kudos uh, in this new environment. Uh, well, let's segue into questions. Uh, we have a couple uh, that have come up already, and I'm hoping there'll be a few more, but still, uh, the first one is from Claude Ezran. And uh, he says, how did intercities commerce work with each city having different standards from other cities, from the other cities? Right, thank you. This is an amazing question. There's a lot long sections in the book about it. So what the merchants bring is just product, right? They don't bring measurement standards. They go to the market, right? And there they find uh, um, officials that somehow measure the product for them, okay? Sometimes this is not done in the market, but it's done actually at the custom house or by the gate. And the custom house and the gate somehow are connected, right? So when they go there, that also is interesting because these officials sometimes are paid by the merchant as well as by the buyer, okay? So this is, for instance, one of the strategies. And uh, uh, which means that they can move to different cities and when they get there, they have to deal with the different measurements, uh, measurement standards, okay? That's, that's, um, that's one of the strategies. When it gets to, uh, let's say, cloth merchants, things that can be stored in the house. So for instance, you, you know, um, I mean, first of all, uh, trade is mostly localized, right? Uh, but you know, uh, for instance, cloth sellers, they can have their own um, wooden bars, which is of an inferior quality, and that gets stamped. And that means that it's regularly uh, um, checked uh, also by the officials, by the authorities uh, um, of the city, right? This is very, very brief, but, so we can go through all the questions, but thank you. It's a good question. Uh, uh, thank you, Manuel. So second question, uh, this is by Martin Juan Weiss. Uh, he says, fascinating and fun, thank you. Why was the PA in, um, in Verona shorter than the Brasile? Wouldn't we expect a unit for answering fields be longer than a unit to measure cloth? Yes, indeed. But in fact, the PA and the canna are connected. So the canna is the super long rod that I showed you. But sometimes that's not easy to display on, the on a monument. So they display the shorter version, the PA, sometimes it's six, sometimes it's 12, a 12th of the canna, right? But sometimes we also find enormous vertical. And uh, in some cities, they decided to represent the whole thing, as we've seen in Erecho. Uh, so, so they're already dealing with... Uh, um, with this question. Sometimes the PA is also used for wood, and that's why sometimes we find, we find that. Thank you. Um, and on to the next one. Uh, this is from Leslie Geddes. Um, she says, uh, thank you very much. I'm struck by the contrast between the groove um, uh, and bracket or void of an incision in, the, in a wall versus an item held in the hand. Can you comment on this media and phenomenological distinction in the execution of the, of the measure? Thank you, thank you for this question. This is for me a fascinating point. How is it possible that the medieval measurements are negative in a way, whereas the modern measurements, including almost ours, at least the meter, are positive? And there is, uh, I, I found a fascinating debate um, that's going on in the Middle Ages, precisely about these issues, where they talk about the void is incorruptible. And therefore, there's this idea that if you can represent measurements in the negative, it's, uh, 
easier actually to maintain a certain degree of stability. And uh, some of the statutes go into great details. It says, you know, if uh, a case scenario is right, you got um, a forger is like, uh, uh, or like an enemy takes over your city. What do you want to do? They can go to the measurement displays and they kind of try to kind of chisel them, right? Uh, but by doing that, they're doing the opposite of what people would like. Um, to do, right? Usually merchants want the measurement standards to be as short as possible so they can make more money while selling products. But if a merchant, let's say by night or like an enemy, will go there and chisel it, will make it longer, right? And therefore will go against his own interest, right? So these are some of the case studies that are brought up in judicial and legal discourses at the time. I think there's also like a philosophical and mathematical dimensions to it, which is kind of fascinating which is connected to the revival of geometry that also starts in the 12th century, and especially Euclid. Uh, Euclid defines the very beginning of the first book of uh, geometry, measurements as essentially immaterial. You know, dots are just like a point in space, they have no substance, and linear measurements, lines, also no measurements. It's the simple reiterations of a dot across time. So therefore, by making them material, you would contravene this kind of key geometrical principles. And we have discussions that talk about, for instance, how in, uh, in some documents, they want uh, some statues, they want to, um, some cities, they want to construct the bars physically, but they say no, because that would give them a particular thickness. And by giving them a thickness, we would make that thickness legal, right? So it's, um, so it's, it's, it's fascinating. And that's why for me, in the Middle Ages, there was this kind of in a sort of way, measurements were debated at a, at, a, at a higher level than what we find in the 18th century, even if the 18th century is considered usually the century where the debate of measurements is actually, um, you know, most important. Thank you. We've got actually several questions. It's uh, amazing uh, uh, how, how, um, how this is bringing about all sorts of different things. Uh, this, is from, this is from Elizabeth Manis, and uh, she says, uh, uh, this is utterly fascinating. Uh, what were the main factors which accounted for the fidelity to enforcement of the measurements? Um, what, what aspects of the measurements accounted for the fidelity? Yeah, yeah. What, what, so if I, if I repeat, what, what were the main factors which accounted for the fidelity to enforcement right. of measurements? This is interesting because I always expected some sort of like objective physical properties, right? But eventually, that's not what happens. At some point in the statute, this says the measurement is correct if the government says so, which means that eventually there's no real any guarantees besides kind of political authority to say, you know, to do so. And, uh, you know, the statute, for instance, says every six months, uh, you know, an inspector needs to go and check the measurement standards and see if they're correct. If they're weathered, you know, it has to remove the whole slab, right, and insert a new one that would match. And it says this official has got the authority to do this kind of shift. And it's possible these things kind of don't, don't quite match. And in fact, we find a lot of scientists already at the time of Galileo, for instance, but also up to like the 18th century, that this says, we started gathering a lot of, let's say, authoritative measurement standards, the one kept by the guild, the one kept by the commune, and they don't match. And of course they don't match because every time you reproduce a measurement standards, you know, you're never gonna get, uh, you know, precisely the same one. And this kind of, difference, uh, no matter how marginal it is, is precisely the ongoing problem of the history of measurements. How do you deal with that kind of error? Uh, eventually, even with the metric system, you know, the meter is not a precise fraction of the earth meridian, uh, eventually you just hide it. How do you hide it? By authority, you know, by saying, you know, it's correct if I say so, basically. <laughs> Okay, our next question, this is by Hector Vera. Have these medieval public standards, uh, have these medieval public standards a connection to the public standards of measure from ancient Greece? Right, this is like a massive debate. So there are some of the standards, uh, uh, for instance, from the Roman period uh, or the Byzantine period, just to talk about the periods that are closest to the Middle Ages, they are similar to the Italian ones. And in fact, I'm not 100% sure that the Italians invented any 
uh, of this display. It's very possible that uh, some of them were imported from the Islamic world, that uh, there's a lot that Italian merchants learned from the Islamic world. And for instance, I talk about how Fibonacci, uh, in the book I talk about how Fibonacci, uh, for instance, uh, saw a lot of these Italian medieval standards in relation to the, uh, the ones that were used in the Islamic world, they were much more widely available across the Mediterranean Sea. But what is fascinating for me is the intensity of the legal, the judicial debates around the standards at the time. And while I can find some connections to, for instance, the um, Justinian corpus or some of the laws that were used in the Byzantine world, I found the level of finesse and the, the directions in which the debate goes in medieval Italy quite different from what happened to the classical world. But I think there's like um, a lot to do at the level to try to find some of the, the connections and the differences between the ancient world and the medieval Mediterranean world. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Our next one uh, Beth, from Beth Seltzer. Did you look at all or could you speculate about how the measurement of time rather than space fits into the story about standardization and the connection with the physical world? Uh, this is an amazing question. It deserves more than one book um, itself. So what is fascinating is that the vast majority of the measurement systems in medieval Italy, at least, are not based on tens, but on 12. And that created a great uh, connections with uh, temporal, um, uh, well, temporal measurements, basically, which is important because it means that in the medieval world, there's a great level of connectivity, actually the harmony between space and time. And a lot of the time space is used to map time, uh, think about like solar clocks, for instance, or for instance, the role of cathedrals in order to tell you the time. So, um, so it's, um, so there are profound connections. And in fact, when we moved to um, a system of measurements based on tenth, which is like the metric system, yes, we gained uh, connections between measurements in the world of arithmetics and maths, but we lost this kind of profound connections between time and space that was so important for the medieval period. So it's something that I, I, I think a lot, and I think there's a lot um, of research to do. I provide some case studies in the book, um, for instance, of these cathedrals. They were supposed to embody particular notions of the perfections of time as well as space. And that itself could cover like a series of lectures. But uh, um, yes, yeah, somehow I think by retrieving how measurements were used, we can also get an idea of how much more profound were the connections between the time in space at the time. So thank you for the question. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, next one is actually from our very own uh, Paula Finland. Uh, she asks, when government changes, example, for example, the end of the nine in Siena, do measurements sometimes change? Also, are there tensions between church and commune over measurements in some cities? Thank you, Paula, for that. Um, questions. Um, so measurements tend not to change because uh, if you change your measurements, you basically have to up update all the legal documents you've created so far, right? Uh, there's also, so the, every government is interested in maintaining some sort of level of durability between, uh, um, you know, between them. Also, measurements are somehow considered to be, uh, to be, um, you know, guaranteeing some sort of cultural identity across time. But there are specific moments where the rupture between governments is so violent that somehow leads to the creations of new measurement standards. And that sometimes is so violent that completely obliterates and erases everything that's been done before, and that creates mess, a total mess. But uh, at that point, we're going like case by case, right? But for instance, we have, uh, um, when governments though create new measurement standards, they are very precise at erasing any trace of the previous measurement standards. But they create enormous problem at the level of legal documents. And there was a second part to the questions. Um, yes. Which I forgot. Yeah, uh, uh, she says, uh, just as an addendum, what is the role of writing in publicizing and defining these measures? 
Right, that's very that's very important as well. There's uh, sometimes we find these kind of uh, measurements that have been uh, like written next to this kind of like uh, um, legal documents as a way to guarantee that the notary will know exactly what a measurement is. Which again, it, sometimes it creates more problems than because it's uh, again a form of multiplication of so measurement standards. And if I go and measure the kind of like the the, the trace on paper and the actual standards, they don't match, so it produces enormous issues. But, uh, but, um, but there's uh, these, these tensions between these various authorities uh, that have power. Oh, and that's the second question you were asking. You know, the questions of the church versus uh, like the, the secular uh, power. Yes, there are enormous tensions. I mean, the case of Verona showed you before, it's an, uh, in incredible case where kind of papal authority determines the fabric of the city, even if the Pope technically has no jurisdictions over the territory of Verona, but it also shows how much more porous medieval space was to questions of power. Different powers could co, uh, co inhabit a city at the same time. Uh, thank you. I, I uh, just want to make a reminder to everyone, uh, and uh, Emmanuel, you have to you have to give me a little bit of feedback here. There are ten more questions. Um, I, I just want to be mindful of time. If people want to leave, uh, they can. Uh, I would like to continue to ask, ask questions as long as Emmanuel's okay with that. I'm, uh, I'm okay. We're okay. Um, and I'll keep going. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Yes. Yes. Exactly. That sounds good. Uh, so the next question is. Um, uh, from Joan Key, uh, and she, uh, she asks, how did the debates concerning the measurement of intensities, for example, hotness, coolness, hardness, softness, etc., affect quantitative measurement? You bring up the importance of materiality, and I'm wondering if the qualitative slash quantitative relationship is mediated through material properties. Hi. First of all, hi, and thanks to Joan. She edited with me the volume on scale, and uh, she's, she's also uh, knows a terrific amount about questions of scale. This is a great question, and uh, indeed, there is uh, uh, the, the, the questions versus materiality comes to a great extent. That's, for instance, also why measurements were not made out of wood. Wood uh, could be bendy, could dry it up. Uh, the variations were visible even to a medieval eye. And that returns to the point of like negativity, right? How in a certain way void does not change so much. And the question is why do you try marble and stone, which is the medieval eye is perceived as an inalterable surface, even culturally speaking, if not physically so. These questions keep changing. For instance, like in the 16th and 17th centuries, boxwood is preferred to other forms of wood because uh, because uh, it's much um, more durable. Uh, there's a tendency for merchants to record measurements on strings, and the old virus is to say, please don't do that. Strings are elastic. It's the least you want is to have uh, like a non reliable ma material when dealing with measurements. And that's eventually leads to the questions of metals, coolness, softness uh, that leads to brass and eventually uh, platinum as the material of preference. So these questions comes with um, debates about new materials well being discovered, but also all materials somehow are being valued precisely to discuss questions of how identities construct materially, really. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Shah Mahmoud Hanifi. How did the measurement of water work in these urban spaces? Right, that's an incredible debate. Uh, but there are some notaries that are specialized in the Middle Ages, that are specialized in this debate. And, uh, and sometimes uh, there are various techniques and there and are a few treatises that I can send you if you're particularly interested in this, but, uh, which has nothing to do with measuring the edges because the waters can shift shifting all the time. So there is a way to geometricize the flows of rivers or ponds, for instance, but there's all the debate about these things change seasonally, seasonally, they can change over time. So legally, how can we guarantee uh, the question? It's, it's an enormous debate. Uh, the greatest, Emmanuel, yeah? I just wanted, uh, sorry for interruption. I think he, no, no, he's clarifying the question here a little bit. He says, uh, my previous question about water concerned the movement of water to and through the city. So ah, oh, I see. So it's not about bodies of water. Okay. 
Okay, that, uh, uh, that's, that's an debate. There's the whole question of nails, how they're being used to somehow, through volume, quantify that. It's, uh, that debate is not massive, though, in the medieval statues that I read. And uh, it's, it's something that comes more across in their early modern and the modern period. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so um, this one is from Maxwell Mutanda. And he's, he, he, he first thanks you for this fantastic talk. And uh, his question is, is there any evidence of the use of measurement to standardize urban development, uh, particularly what today would be considered building regulations and planning permission standards from the local authority? Oh, it's massive, it's massive. Actually measurements are enthusiastically deployed to maintain consistent constructions in the urban, uh, within the urban space, uh, they use also to uh, somehow control the city walls, uh, to plan expansions of the city. It's, um, it's used really throughout. Towers have to be of a particular height. Cathedrals cannot uh, be shorter than the newer buildings, you know, like, so there's a massive debate in the book, I cover quite a lot of this material. And not just the city, but also the sort of contado, which is the kind of like surrounding territory, the one outside the city. Fields have to uh, match particular sizes. There's an attempt to mathematize, kind of rationalize uh, the whole territory. And, and that's why measurements are so important at the time. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next uh, question is from someone we both know, uh, Kate Holohan. Uh, uh, hi, Kate. Uh, she asks, could you speak more about the purposeful association of standard measures with the earth itself? And of course, I'm really interested in it as well. Uh, was, the thinking, was, the, was the thinking that measurements were part of the natural order of things and that power was thus also part of the natural order? Right, interesting question. So the, the, the debates about whether measurements should be part of the natural order is usually presented as a modern question. And I think it's true. I, I, I found no evidence in the media world that thought about measurements as natural. Indeed, they mostly talk about them as uh, artificial, as kind of like uh, um, constructed by authority. There is, however, like a debate of the our debate uh, where um, we talk about the questions of measurements in relation to the human body. As you notice, a lot of these kind of measurement standards uh, are named after body parts. They're perfectly aware that actually they don't correspond. You know, sometimes a foot is like this, which will be the foot of a giant. Uh, but nevertheless, in the medieval period, they think that these are somehow evolutions, artificial, arbitrary evolutions of what was used in the past. So there is still this idea that somehow measurements and nature are not connected and the human body somehow mediates between the two. It is a different idea though of the natural order as it is understood and, and debated in the modern period, right? But for me, it's also interesting, this kind of connections to the ground, to um, to maybe nature not as a kind of like natural force, but somehow how the medieval uh, period already prepares with some of these questions that are then debated at uh, the modern, in the modern period. Thank you, I'm trying to be very concise. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Manuel. Uh, so next question is from Sasan Hazad Hazigi. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, presentation. Also, what is the etymology of the different terms to use to denote a new unit of length in each of the regions you discussed? And is there a connection to the units used by the Romans throughout their empire? Sometimes there are connections, sometimes they aren't. So the, the way, way it's happening, so Italy was mostly dominated by the state of Roman Empire, there were lots of Byzantine Islamic influences as well. But what happens after the peace of Constance, there is a shattering of authority, right? So each city starts working independently and they decide how to basically, I'm simplifying to an excessive degree here, but how they dealing with their own measurement standards. Some of them decide in favor of continuity to use Roman standards, sometimes maintaining Roman standards, or what they thought were Roman standards, sometimes innovating from them. Sometimes they decided to use a modern units of measurement that they find that they're, they're more beneficial for the management of their own territory. And sometimes they're trying to mediate between the two, producing ever different kind of like constellations or systems of measurements that sometimes don't make much sense. Also, there are questions 
of immigration. For instance, uh, Bologna at some point decides to import a lot of workers from Verona because their kind of textile industry is very much uh, um, um, advanced, much more advanced than in Bologna. And as a way to lure these artisans, they promise them to use the, the measurements they already know, which means that today Bologna for cloth still uses a cl the measurements as was used in Verona at the time. And that produces this sort of kind of like some forms of crossings that has produced this kind of kaleidoscopic um, landscape, metric landscape that we still see today. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, so our next question is by Yari Perez Marin. And uh, the question is, could you comment on the severity, severity of the punishment for merchants found not adhering to the standards compared to other kinds of infractions? Oh, it's crazy. I mean, uh, it's uh, um, so the merchant that is found uh, um, uh, that is kind of faking the measurements is stripped naked, usually um, splashed with cold water by everyone. Kids can splash waters in it, chained to this kind of canopies. That's what happened in, in Verona, or whipped through the streets of the city, which means is is being derided by the whole city, by the whole population. It's a loss of authority, and basically, with the loss of authority, means that you can no longer trade in the city, right? Uh, so they're like physical pun punishment, they're like uh, uh, humiliations, kind of mortifications of the flesh, you name it. And then if it happens again, sometimes they cut your hand. If it happens again, you get blinded. They vary from city to city, but the severity of the punishment gives a sense of how important the matter was for these people. Very good. I'm gonna combine uh, two questions from the same person here because they're related and you've already answered part of it. Uh, his name is Philip Schoss and he asks initially, what impact uh, do, these standards of, do these standards of measurement have on the built environment of the cities, a large impact, I suppose, he says. But then um, Philip is saying, since you've already answered the question in part, a few specifics slash favorite examples would be appreciated. Yes, and then also we, we're talking here just about the architectural development of the city, but we, we have to think about how every form of production was standardized, you know, bread making, cloth making, fashion itself, you know, me, you know there was, you know, um, authorities like measuring the train of the dresses of women and they stop them in public. And I have a case, for instance, from Bologna, uh, talk about this and how they were, again, subjected to sort of public humiliations where their clothes were measured and they have to conform to some particular standards. There's basically no aspect of public uh, uh, life that remains unturned in these periods. Bologna for me is a fascinating case to talk about public development and architectural developments because the city there goes uh, to tremendous, tremendous extent to make sure that uh, um, private uh, owners uh, would not overstep their boundaries. So they come up with an amazing system, which is basically they create this kind of like a stone stakes and they bury them in the ground and they take the measurements between them. And every six months they dig them and they take them out and they want to make sure that no gutter, no sign, no let's say table and chairs is overstepping public boundaries. And in the book, uh, I explain how it works. Or there's another case, for instance, of the city of Brescia, where they to decide how to um, expand and how to plan such an expansion. And again, they measure all the lots in advance to make sure they will know how to tax it, to make sure it'd be fair when assigning them to specific citizens. So, so measuring permeates, the, um, the constructions of urban space at the time. Great, thank you. Uh, we're down to about two or three more. Uh, this is from Ade uh, Mabogunde. Uh, he is actually someone who also uh, has, has uh, used uh, the center services. So hi Ade. Um, what, his question is, what were the spheres of society that uh, drove measurement? Today I see mm. commerce, religion, land ownership, political legal authority. However, that is from today's perspective. Great question. In a way, the same spheres were in competition at the same times, not always at the same level. Sometimes, for instance, uh, the merchants were considered for a long 
period of time, like inferior to the government. But then what happens in the, in the late Middle Ages is that the merchants start gaining so much economic power that eventually they kind of take over the politics. That's the classic case is Florence, for instance. And therefore they start, you know, um, deciding the measurements. In fact, still today, in, well, still today in Florence, until the 18th century, in Florence, there is the, is the length for cloth that became the standard measurements, not, for instance, the, the, um, the standard for uh, fields, right, which is what happened in most of the cities, which gives you a sense of how important the mercantile community had become in Florence at the time, right? Even fields that's being measured with the standards for cloth, which kind of makes no sense, right? Um, so you got that. I mean, if anything, what was important is what um, Paula was pointing out before, is the importance of religion. Um, and, and that's something that I find absolutely fascinating. Uh, the authorities sometimes, uh, the medieval authorities, realize that the most learned people and the most authoritative people in the cities are friars and priests, and therefore sometimes they give the measurement standards to them. So that they have the right to, well, they have the duty to somehow educate the population, but also because they because of the vow of poverty, because it's supposed to be fair by default, because of the divine authority. These are people that somehow are supposed to be considered trustworthy, right? So that adds an, an extra layer that makes the history of medieval measurements fascinating. Okay. Um I'm going to stop questions over there. I have four more for you, but that's the end, I think, at this point. We have, we're well past time. Uh, so let me quickly uh, uh, ask those. This is from Frank Drobot. Um, and his question is, uh, it's a really interesting one. Linear standards such as cuts in a wall are difficult to counterfeit. But standards of weights could be counterfeited. How were weight and volume standards in Fascinating questions. In fact, uh, as you notice, I mostly talk about length standards. Uh, and that's because weights, usually they were always by default protected in the saves uh, of situation. Not always, we have, I found some cases where these were also carved in marbles, but they kind of don't um, survive long in the open. It, they recede uh, within the, the governmental buildings much, much uh, faster than linear standards. So, but this for me also opens up questions about um, which typology of standards becomes the dominant. Somehow today, especially with the metric system, is somehow the meter, the length that is taken over. And somehow that's the one that keeps all the other standards together, is the one that is kind of presented as the primary one, which somehow means the space may matter more than volume, right? But that was not necessarily the case in the Middle Ages. Questions of weight and capacities um, were extremely important. Things about, for instance, the co connections in currency between coinage and weight, right? Um, but, but that's, I think, also what, what, what's happening at the time. Because the technology of reproducing standards, length standards, was easier than the one to reproduce um, volumes, weight and so on, they start taking a more prominent role in both displaying authority, but also in standing for the authority, which means that whenever possible, uh, the official authorities, they're trying to rely on standards of length rather than weight. And that's what we find a lot in the medieval documentations of the time. So somehow there is a, somehow a politics also of typologies of measurements that we have to acknowledge, not just one between various authorities. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, uh, from Onyx Salgado, and uh, he says, fantastic presentation. In, is there, in any other artworks that you can find, details of measurement such as the one on the fresco in Siena? I mean, the Frost container is amazing because the amount of detail is fantastic. The, you can even tell that the measurements are made, for instance, of copper and so on. It's exactly as you say, the statues, which means there was a direct connection. So, you know, this means the painter basically was instructed by officials and notaries so that what uh, the rulers were saying was actually was in use in Siena. Unfortunately, we don't find that same level of precision in the representation, the depictions of measurements. Uh, 
as we find uh, in Siena. We find in the Libro del Biadaiolo, which is kind of basically a diary of the market life in Florence, pretty much also around the 1350s. Also the pictures of measurements, mostly vo volumes and weights. And there's a precise uh, representation, which are probably influenced by the Lorenzo Pifasco, by the way. And then we have to wait the 15th century, basically, the late, the late 15th century to find accurate depictions, right? Uh, which is also in a way why it's so difficult to talk about the standards and why they've been overlooked for such uh, long periods of time. But I hope in my book that by bringing together the, the legal documentations, the religious uh, witnesses, uh, the urban fabric, some of these depictions, um, you know, some of the objects that I find in the archives to somehow put together the kind of pieces of a puzzle and try to kind of like uh, put, uh, produce enough material that makes us comfortable in speaking about these questions also for the Middle Ages. Thank you. Uh, second to last question, and, and I, I don't, I'm not sure if I understand this via a question, but it was in the chat window, and this is from Anthony Picon. Rodriguez, and he asks, uh, do you think what, for, uh, I think he means when, do you think when did formas of space measurement end? So I- oh, I'm sorry, uh, can you say that again? I didn't get it. What? So uh, it's a, he, he says, do you think what forms of, when did formas of space measurement end? I, I, I don't think, um, I may, maybe, when, what form? When, I, I mean, if, uh, if, uh, when the forms of spatial measurements end, I don't know what it is. I mean, we, we still measure space today and uh, they continue measurement. Uh, if, if it's about when they stop becoming prevalent, I don't know, because like with the metric system, as I said before, the space somehow still takes the lead, right? And my whole point is like, is it really the meter that's making uh, space taking the lead or there's a somehow 500 years of history of measurements that somehow prepare the way to the meter so that all the innovations that we associate to the meters actually they were already discussed uh, and not just in italy but in europe uh, 500 years before if i under yeah yeah so so I, if, you, if you're around please go ahead and, and clarify but we'll go to the last question and uh this is i've uh, made sure everybody who has at least one question uh gets gets an answer or at least have an option for you to answer this is by hector vera he he has he uh, he had another question earlier on, and this, he says, um, "Is your interpretation of historical metrolo metro metrology different uh, from Vitold Kula's ideas of authority in pre-modern Europe?" Thank you, thank you for this, Vitold Kula. Vitol Kula is one of my heroes. He's done like an amazing amount of work, um, Mar uh, Marxist perspective of measurements, really understanding. He's really the, probably the first one to understand the profound connections between power and uh, uh, measurements. He mostly focused though on France and Poland. So he, and, and he's mostly a scholar of the early modern period, is uh, main, you know, field of specializations in the 18th century. So the material I'm dealing with is a little bit different. And while I would say that my work does not invalidate his, I think he adds nuance and maybe also the questions. Because one of the questions for his, as I'm talking mostly about, is like, uh, could, there, could there be metric objectivity? And not just like for the medieval period. This is open to like a deluge of other questions, I know. But uh, one of the things that uh, all these kind of medieval documents reveal is that actually medieval people, including authorities, have no faith in measuring. And this is because it goes back to like old questions of Aristotle, that measuring is not like counting. With the metric system, we're supposed to see the measure, measuring, uh, let's say geometry, as uh, a form of mathematics, like the two are somehow connected, right? We mathematize space after Descartes, right? But that was not at the time. And then the question is like, because the question is like, when do you see the ends of measuring? That is, you're measuring a piece of cloth, right? You're putting the ruler right there. When do you stop? Exactly when the standard ends, like, uh, or you consider the thickness of the chalk that you may be holding. Also, you kind of like putting aside, or you stretch the piece of fabric. They realize all these issues because they come up in the notary uh, documents we have. 
And they were also ridiculed. We have novella and short stories that I talk about, for instance, in the book, where uh, these things are being questioned, right? Uh, and the point that's, uh, that Aristotle brings up and that the medieval authorities understood is like, uh, that's the thing. Measuring is impossible. Measuring eventually. And it talks about cutting the cloth. It's like, when do you decide to cut the cloth? Uh, where? And it's like, it's impossible. Eventually, it can only rest over an authority. Because you can debate about this kind of like millimeter distinctions for as long as you want. But eventually, you have to make the cut. And the cut can only come from our authority. And that's the point when, for Aristotle, measuring and mathematics, they're completely different. Measuring uh, is always, by definition, flawed, whereas mathematics is the realm of perfection. And somehow, the whole history of measurements is this kind of ongoing struggle and attempt to make this kind of two mathematical realities kind of like coincide. Wow, uh, that was absolutely fantastic. I, I'm so uh, thank you so very much for waiting and answering all the questions very patiently. It was an amazing. Oh, it's talk. a pleasure. Yeah, and uh, thank you for being sort of the guinea pig here with respect to our first talk. And I think it I think it went really well. Um, what I'm going to do, uh, I have, um, um, uh, I, I want to just quickly uh, put in a, um, a plug for our upcoming talks. Um, uh, I put it in the chat box. If you just go to bit.live slash Rumsey Newsletter, um, I'm just going to share my screen for just a minute and then we'll say goodbye. So let me just go to um, uh, the share screen over here and uh, share my screen. Um, uh, let's see here. Hold on. I cannot even see my own screen. There we go. Uh, yes. Uh, so you can see over here, um, uh, this is our newsletter. And the next talk uh, is on May 8th, uh, Chet Van Duzer. Uh, he has uh, uh, spoken several times at the center before. And he's going to talk about his latest book, uh, based on the Carta Marina of 1516. Um, and uh, these, uh, so this is, this is upcoming. Uh, there he is. And then we're going to have Lauren Killen's work return to Stanford. Um, she did her undergrad here, went on to Cambridge, did a master's degree, going on to a PhD uh, and uh, MD program. But she's going to talk about uh, mapping an epidemic. Um, and, and she's going to talk about cholera in 19th century uh, colonial India. So I'm really excited to have her back. Um, uh, she uh, she was she presented at the first uh, Barry Lawrence Ruderman conference. So uh, she's coming up. So and then uh, in June we are going to have Peter Hiller, uh, and he's going to talk about Joe Mora's maps. Um, so uh, every month uh, we are doing a maps in focus. Um, uh, Andrea Renner put this together. Uh, this is uh, one on medicine. We had one on disease last time, and we'll have something else coming up. So uh, please uh, t check it out. Uh, uh, bit.ly uh, slash uh, Ramsey newsletter and you can get to it. So um, I very much, uh, let me just um, uh, get back here and let me see if I can uh, um, get back here. Um, again, uh, uh, Manuel, thank you so very much uh, for, for, uh, for this presentation. Uh, I, I look forward to more in the future and, uh, and, and again, fascinating talk and a fascinating book. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>